good morning, everyone. Here we are with We're doing it. Dubele and Jennifer Hayes in New York and Alex Rose in Chicago. Hello. And we have the honor and privilege to have these two finest storytellers and image makers with us this morning. But I get to tell the, the story first. Fine. And then you get to listen to the longest bio session ever. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm going to, oh, good. I'm going to go away from this background here. All right. Okay. Do we sing this magazine? Oh, Ocean Realm. 1989. This is about the, about the time I first learned and hear about David Dubele. I remember this line that they say, underwater photography easy, jump into the water, take the camera and take a picture. <laughs> then I was, I indulged in, in this story many, many times. I was quite poor then. And then my girlfriend at the time, she actually cut off this little hole here. I say, why do you cut this hole at the bottom of his picture? <laughs> I, I, I almost killed her then, but she said, I ordered the book for you. Oh, uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh. It's David, an almost excuse. David Dubley, first book. Well, oh. My Bible, the, the, the images in here are really a hit of its time. And from time to time, I still go back to this book. So that is my history lesson. Go ahead, Alex. That's awesome. Well, we well, probably have people like right over there on the shelf. We, we do, so. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good stuff. You, we only got this here, so we have to. Oh, yeah. fancy. Michael likes to show off his signed book collection to make everybody jealous. That's what he does now. Whatever. Well, next time, and I'll, and I'll get signs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, folks, get ready for the bio session of the decade. All right. <laughs> so I would imagine most people watching this probably already know who the two of you are. But on the off chance there is anyone who doesn't, enjoy the next four minutes. So David Dubolet and Jennifer Hayes are a photographic team for National Geographic magazine focusing on ocean environments. Their photography is a universal language to create a visual voice for a fragile and finite world. Hayes began diving in her early teens and has since spent about 11,000 hours beneath the surface. Her doctoral research focused on telemetry, habitat, and population dynamics of sturgeon. Her interest in science communication and the conservation of endangered species was a catalyst to reach beyond teaching and research to share science through storytelling and imagery. She's an award-winning photographer, contributor, editor, and author of numerous publications and books on marine environments. She's a recipient of the President's Medal for Natural History, a trustee of the Shark Research Institute, Explorers Club National Fellow, and speaker for National Geographic Live. Moving on to David. David Jubilee is one of the world's most celebrated underwater photographers. With about 27,000 logged hours underwater, he's an explorer, pioneering conservation photographer, marine naturalist, and protector of the ocean world. He's a contributing editor and an author of a dozen titles, including the award-winning book, Water, Light, Time. Dubolet is also a founding member of the International League of Conservation Photographers and a longtime Rolex testimony. David shot his first story for National Geographic in 1971 on garden eels. Over the years, he's photographed 75 stories and 13 covers. He's the recipient of more awards than I am willing to delve into this evening, but uh, some of the really big ones are the Academy of Achievement Award, the Leonard Nilsson Award, and the Explorers Club Noel Lowell Thomas Award. Both David and Jen are contributors to Ocean Geographic Magazine and have been principal photographers for all three of our Elysium expeditions. And uh, I was talking to Jen earlier, and rumor has it that the two of them met underwater, both observing a pregnant lemon shark. Interesting stuff. Fun yeah. factoid that people don't get to know. And it would Mass. not look at first bite or sight. Sorry. But yes, <laughs> meet underwater in Bimini, Bahamas. Wow. Wow. That was cool stuff. Decades ago. And that was a long bio, and I didn't know anything of, of that about you at all. You're no. like, are, are, are you guys super impressed by each other? I mean, I would be. 
<laughs> and, oh, and the, the lemon shark gave birth. That's right. Really? Yeah. Over yeah. the birth of a lemon shark. Yeah. Wow. I hope yeah. there were at least two so you could get pups each, one each. There no? Pups. There were pups. We put every one of them through university. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank goodness. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we will dive right in. I will get your presentation up on the screen. Hold on. Well, thank you for <laughs> very Michael. in-depth introduction. Oh, you're and welcome. You you're you're very fine. welcome. Yeah, you better get fancy now. <laughs> fancy. All right. Peas in the tuna noodle casserole starting now. <laughs> All right. All right, let's you, see it. The one thing about our isolation right well, a couple things. First of all, you know, all of us, all of us feel that, uh, well, we've always considered that the, the world is our oyster. The planet is where we go to and where we look at things, we make images and we return with images. The world is our oyster is a wonderful quote from William Shakespeare. But things have changed. The planet had other plans for us right now. And in this time, there's a lot of time that we have right now to look back and reflect and think about how we have we dealt with our underwater lives and what it means to us and the people we've worked with and everything that we've done Jennifer and I have done in our underwater existence requires collaboration this picture of these garden eels was the first picture that I published in National Geographic magazine that had my byline on it. And the woman hanging on to the back of the blind there, this picture made in the Red Sea, and that's a blind. And of course, in the front are garden eels. He's the species called Gorgasia sil silmeri. You see a little face peeking out there? That's me with my round mask. And I have a 40 foot extension cord that makes this picture. And uh, the garden eels came up. It took three weeks to make the picture. I worked with another great photographer at National Geographic named Jim Stanfield, and I made the picture. But the picture couldn't have been made without Dr. Eugenia Clark. She and I went on to, uh, to do almost 13 articles and another, I think, three or four that he, uh, she wrote with Emery Kristoff in a career that spanned uh, three decades or more. And when she started as a, as a female marine biologist, about five to 7% of marine biology students were women then. Now it's more than 40 or 50%. This is the influence that she had. But there's something else too, and this is the show and tell. I'm, I'm, I love show and tell. Ready for show ready and tell? Ready for this. Okay. Yeah, no. We're so ready. <laughs> but the entire time. This picture right. could never be made without this. You see this? Oh. Connect this is a camera housing called an ocean eye. An ocean eye. And it is enormously heavy because it features this wonderful eight inch compass dome. And this was an invention by my colleague and my friend and famous National Geographic photographer, Bates Little Hales, and the brilliant engineer named Gomer McNeil. Every single underwater picture that's a wide angle image owes its allegiance and its DNA to this giant housing. It's sort of crude looking. It has, if you can see it, it has kind of handles that are off a, uh, a, a bicycle, actually a, <laughs> one of the puffy banana bicycles, um, but it worked. And of course it worked because everything else came into being then, like a, a Nikon F and a action finder and all of these things and new strobes and this is what uh, this is what it meant to me this is my first picture and uh it happened that one morning in the red sea and lo and behold 47 years later i made another picture of garden eels can we show the next one mm -hmm. and this is a picture of garden eels taken in the philippines this uh, last year won the uh, WPOY, uh, Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition for the underwater. I'm very proud of that. But it's been 47 years and 75 stories 
and it's the return. It's always a kind of return on how life goes along. And uh, photography is like that. Photography is memories and thought and composition and dreams. And we deal with a world always underwater that's surreal and intensely beautiful and full of composition and life. Let's go to another picture. Wait, and, wait, wait, and, and, David. Yeah. You, I remember you set up a remote for that. Yeah. So it really was full circle. I remember swearing a lot getting that. <laughs> Um, and it was a whole nother remote setup with Leandro Blanco there and Lynn Funkhauser. Lynn, if you're there, thank you for introducing us to the Philippines. Sim, Sim, thank you, thank, thank you. you. And yes, I remember David here, you wanna hear a little story? David said, there's a colony of garden meals. I've studied this whole thing in Dumaguete and we have to go and I'm like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> and it took like two days, it was like a setup and a trial and a failure and a trial and a failure. And he had to do this. And through this whole thing, I was, yeah, I was like, not sure. And, but he wanted to go back to his roots. And that was a result of it. And then WPOTY liked it. And so Leo, Lynn, thank you. And the people of Dumaguete. And the and people Dumaguete. of the, And all our friends in the Philippines. And so, everything is a collaboration. Full circle back to Jeannie. And, and I, collaboration. Yeah. And, and collaboration. Now, here's the amazing thing. Jeannie Clark was Jennifer's professor. She was. I was her last graduate student and she retired. I'm hoping not because of me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, very right. possible, Jennifer, very possible. <laughs> very possible. Right, let's roll, let's roll. <laughs> you know, I, I started out in photography shooting black and white. There's a lot of reasons for it and I was lucky that I stumbled into it. First underwater housings had no uh, control for the f-stops. So you had a choice between focus or exposure. And uh, obviously you choose focus. Uh, focus incidentally is not passe, it's very important still. And shooting black and white underwater are the hardest single images that exist in underwater photography because they are elemental. They're based on moment, they're based on time, they're based on light. The, all the elements of what makes an underwater image work. And this was, a, this, was this enormous school of, of Barracuda and Sipadan Island. Divers swam into them and the Barracuda did this, this uh, question mark, this uh, incredibly strange Brancusi-like school of things. And that's what's wonderful about black and white. If I had my choice and I could go back and shoot, I would just shoot black and white. Yeah, you're a little obsessed with that. Yeah. And clownfish. And clownfish. I'm not sure which one is more. Just a little clownfish. Just a little. Okay. All right. What do you think, Alex? Let's. I think I think we could potentially keep going if you'd like. Okay. Let's try. Yeah. Let's see this. This is. Yeah. This is a moment underwater, and there's no doubt about it that this profession and this life of people who are not doing this for a profession. But you know that it's a, it's a business, it's a world, it's a life of extreme joy to do something like that. And when a moment happens, this is a decisive moment, the same kind of decisive moment that uh, Cartier-Bresson talked about in photography, the same kind of decisive moment that street photographers talk about. Underwater, it's a little harder to do. And this, this happened in the, in the Galapagos. And this school formed and reformed and then it made a perfect ball. And just as it did that, one parrotfish swam by, no relationship to the school at all. And people say, well, what does this mean to you? What is the meaning of this? And, you know, the meaning of this obviously is that uh, it can mean anything you want. Uh, the picture was bought by Oprah magazine and used as an illustration for loneliness. Yeah, it could mean yeah. now. It could yeah. mean isolation. Yeah. It could yeah. mean quarantine. It could mean hope. It could mean, it could mean friendship. It could yes. mean anything. But what I do like about it is everybody inter interprets it a little differently. And you know, so some of these images sell a stock, right? Do you want to know what this image sell sells the most to? There's a genre. It goes out to legal offices, to attorneys for some reason. So all really? of you, 
Yeah. 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 It's like a wall size thing on a number of attorneys walls. So whoever can wow. figure it out, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe get back to me. Yeah. Back to us. yeah that was all the shark pictures. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> I figured saying. what the attorney did. I'm like, I really want that for my, yeah, for my love. I'm like, okay, I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and in Australia, Michael. So there, oh. whatever, whatever oh. that is. All right. Interesting. So, but talk, talk about emotion. Hey. This is ah. emotion. Oh. Yeah. This is the harbor of Futo. Futo, Japan. Futo is a little, perfect little fishing village. It's about 60 miles uh, south of Tokyo on the Izu Peninsula, uh, on the outside of the Izu Peninsula, the Kurashio current size. And uh, we worked in Futo with my friend uh, Koji Nakamura who is a, a genius underwater photographer and underwater videographer and has a wonderful company in Japan. And we worked there on a story for, uh, for Geographic on the, uh, on the world of the uh, Izu Kayakogen uh, underwater park. And Futo was at the edge of it and we operated from Futo and we were doing it for about three months and working every day. And they said to us one day, you can't come back, we need three days. I said, how come? And they said, well, because we've caught dolphins. And the dolphin fishermen, who don't belong to this village, but they're kind of freelance, had caught and forced in almost 1,100 dolphins into the harbor. They put a net over the mouth. And in the next three days, they began to slaughter the dolphins. And I said, can I photograph? And the head man of the village, who was the head of the fishing cooperative, said, yes, you can. And wow. uh, he let me stand there on this quay and how they slaughter them as they pick up the rostrum of the dolphin as they pull in about a hundred each time and uh, slice their throats and they, the dolphins bleed to death. And you can hear them cry. The cries came up through the concrete of the cave, the foreground there, uh, through my feet or through my legs into my diaphragm, into my heart. And it was one of the most incredibly uh, awful, extraordinary moments of my life. And the pictures had some power. They made some change. But sometimes change is not as dramatic as this picture. It could be this next picture. All right, what do we got here? Alan? This is Stingray City in the Cayman Islands. Everybody knows about it then, but when I made these pictures, uh, there were seven stingrays. For years, uh, the fishermen would clean their catch right over this beautiful sandbar. Stingrays would come, and then a photographer named Jay Ireland, another man named Pat Kenny, decided, well, we could feed these dangerous animals, you know, stingrays. If you stepped on them, you'd be in big trouble, and people were kind of afraid of them. And they began to feed them, and they began to gather around seven stingrays. Now, after all these years in the pictures and in the cover story for Geographic, it is the most popular dive snorkel spot in the world. And the seven stingrays have blossomed into almost 200, 250, more than that right now. In other words, shoot it, share it, they will come, they become valuable, then they're protected. They're protected. And, just be, and when those are protected, so is the ecosystem around it. So a symbol that pictures have power. Is that right? You're, is that your pictures, pictures have power, power, and they have the power to influence. They have the power to open people's eyes to the sea. They have the power to convince the un unconvinced. I've always thought that way. And, and one of the things that underwater photographers do is do this, specifically all over the world. You make a picture, it's successful, or you love it, and it might get published or seen, and people come to the pl same place, other underwater photographers, and that's how animals and creatures in this ocean get protected. We do it, and we open the, we open the world's eyes. All righty. One of your favorite places. One of my favorite places. This was a <laughs> bay, Kindy Bay, Walindi Plantation. You know, it's, it's I, I was there years ago, and I made 
I made when I was there. I, I wait. Just, what, wait. How long? I was there years ago. Well, How many years ago were you there? But before that picture. Between this picture and when I was there before, it was, was almost 15, 16 area. years ago. All right. And I, I went there. I had four diving days, and I made in those four diving days two covers. Something I've never done in my life at, at, at Geographic. And I had to come back and it took us 15 years and we finally got back there because they wanted a story for the 125th anniversary. And we got back there and, and what was going to be an easy story became one of the hardest stories we've ever done. A lot had to do with climate change and, and uh, bends and malaria and everything else like this. This is in the last couple of days. It always happens in the last few days. And uh, we found a place that wrapped up the entire reason why Kinby Bay is such an incredible place. It, it withstood the test of time. And we found this little island, we own Jennifer and I, our guides, and it was beautiful. And as we're shooting, the, this uh, father and son came by in a uh, outrigger canoe, and it was just everything sort of came together. So David, I'm going to rat you out about right now. Yeah. So this was basically the assignment that was a gift from heaven. The phone rang, National Geographic, Kathy Moran saying, you guys have been selected to contribute to the special 125th anniversary edition of the magazine. That was great news. The better news was well, you get to go anywhere you want to go. David mm -hmm. chose Kimmy Bay because he's always wanted to go back there. That was the highlight. And then came a monsoon, the worst ever in decades, bridges out, oh. no visibility. Uh, Max Benjamin saying, come, don't come, 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 don't come. We went, the reefs were there, they were healthy, we just couldn't see them <laughs> for like, <laughs> and there was, there was a lot of sweating and swearing involved, and there was malaria and some chikungunya thrown in there because of oh. all, the, all the monsoon, and oh. it was just, uh, it was just a crazy time, and it was a collaboration. We had Leo Blanco with us and the whole team at Will Lindy. Um, and it was, was an amazing effort. And what happened was, see, this half and half, David, on every assignment, searches for a split level over and under, half and half, whatever you would like to call it. And there is this, always this one moment, the entire time we're on assignment, he's looking for that relationship between the surface and the hidden world beneath. And it took, well, it happened next to the last yeah. day with an entire collaboration of Will Indy. We yeah. found it and it kind of says everything that's going on there. So, yay. And um, I think that was my, my first day back in the water after malaria. So yeah. that was, yeah, that was. Oh, pointy. wow. Yeah. All right. Jeff. Let's see. Ay, ay, ay. Another one of your favorite Another places. places. <laughs> Dying to go back here too. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> as we know, it's a favorite place, the South Pass of Fakarava. Mm -hmm. I want everybody Alex, home you know. in their living room to raise their hand if they've ever been to Fakarava or if they ever want to go to Fakarava, and you gotta go to Fakarava. Because it's <laughs> one of the few places on the planet where that has an incredibly healthy shark population and incredibly healthy reef system, which is why we went there. And it also happens to be the place where there's a, an enormous spawning of groupers, an enormous feeding of groupers, and uh, it's one of the great interactions on, on the planet. But what I like best is this relationship between the sky and the coral and the sharks. And it was, uh, for me, it was a dream, and I can't wait to go back there. There's, there's pictures there that I dream of, still do. He's on a secret mission yeah. to go back. He's got a picture in mind that I hear about in the middle of the night and is, yeah, he like talks about it, wakes up talking about it. So we're gonna go back and try this one picture that I think is next to impossible to make. But now we'll perfect. See. I know, it's a challenge, <laughs> it's really challenging. I'm, uh, yeah, whoever would like to can join us because it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be interesting to see if it can be done. So I think, Alex, the next thing is a video of Fakarava. Yes. Uh, what it's like and why we're trying to seduce people to go. This is why wow. you have to go to Fakarava. Look at this place. Oh, good sound. Is it gonna play? Uh, Alex, I'm gonna share, share your sound, Alex. Share computer sound.
your end, Alex? It like is. A tiny bit, but not much. It's the computer yeah. catching up, but we will yeah. we'll put in there a good video in the final chapter when we finish. All righty. It actually looks better on Facebook than it does to us watching it, so well, if that helps go. at all. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, that and my tea. That's good. That is always good. You know. We're uh, in my favorite place, David, yeah. this place. Western Greenland. We're almost what? 75 degrees north, somewhere there. And it's, uh, I love making the images that are half and half out of the water, above and below images, because it brings two worlds together. And an iceberg is the perfect metaphor for the ocean, because it's a little bit above, 20% above, 80% below, unseen, unknown, totally sculptural. And to shoot these things is, is a great joy. And there's always uh, shooting icebergs. There's always a, 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 an artifact, a figment of light that happens that's always exciting. And sometimes, you know, sometimes everything comes together. This is a favorite. The next picture is a real favorite picture of mine because it's a picture I dreamed about when I was little. Penguins. I've always loved penguins. But now you're in another hemisphere, but now, mister. But now we are south. <laughs> we are in uh, Danko Bay. Uh, on the peninsula of Antarctica. And we found the perfect iceberg. Actually, it's called a bergy bit. And the bergy, and the bergy bit uh, uh, mini iceberg had a group of Gentoo and chinstrap penguins, which were uh, fighting. They were playing this game called King of the Iceberg, King of the Iceberg. And what they would do <laughs> is they would push each other off and one of them would, the other, the person, the penguin would fly down one side of the iceberg and pop up on the other side. And it was, it was, <laughs> it was great. It went on and on and on like that. And the game continued. And Jennifer and I were in the water for hours and hours, just dreams like this. So this is the Antarctic Peninsula. And the next place is probably. Well, that's St. Andrews Bay, South Georgia. Okay, everybody, if you haven't been to the Antarctic Peninsula, you got to go. And if you haven't been to South Georgia, save up your money and go. It is one, it is, it's wild, it's remote, it's real, and it's protected, and it's prospering. How many places <laughs> on the planet can we say that about? So these are, these are king penguins. That's about 200,000 200 that's about 400,000 birds yes. when you ish yeah when ish you, if you count them when you first see them you, you land before uh before sunrise way before sunrise i came up a little hillock the, you know the, the colony goes on and on but there's a little hillock not far from the beach and i waited and you hear this rustling like a million people talking in another room that you can't quite hear and then the sun comes up and it is an extraordinary place. When I first saw these penguins, wasn't quite, it wasn't in St. Andrews, but in another place on, on the first Elysium expedition, another photographer came up to me and said, have you ever seen such a gathering of, of life, an intensely gathering of, of life anywhere on the planet? And I said, of course, uh, Times Square, Sydney Harbor, all of these places. Uh, and we are, of course, the dominant species on this planet. And for this scene to continue, on and on, millennium, on and on and on. It's up to us to make sure that this keeps going. It is our responsibility. You know, it just occurred to me, that is anti-social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, don't do this right now. <laughs> that is Times Square on New Year's Eve. And um, not one of them is wearing a mask yes. like, uh, oh. like President Pence. No, but it is one of the <laughs> greatest pulses of life and I just um I tell everybody to see these and then the next question is this wait a minute Jennifer when we speak for Nat Geo Live when we say you should try to see these places if you can to experience them and then valid question in the audience but what if their ecotourism becomes ecoterrorism what if too many people go and the beauty of a lot of these places now are they are regulated and they have thresholds and they have rules and they have oversight. So we can't become eco-terrorists. That's what I like about it. 
they are protected and we are limited in our access to it. And I love that because that means these guys can prosper and those that can visit can. And I like yep, that about yep, it. Yep. So it's, it's fabulous. Now we have another video. And while when we're on assignment, what I, what we're doing, we work as a team and we both shoot underwater. We both shoot stills, but I also shoot video. So while we're shooting stills, I might set down the camera underwater and then go shoot video or set up remote video. So the sharks in Fakarava or these penguins that we're going to see here in St. Andrews Bay, what I'm trying to do is for storytelling, we have multiple platforms with that we have to submit under now. Still photography is the primary, but when we're on a digital platform, we have, we just, there is an insatiable appetite for assets and a lot of it is video. So Alex, let's see what this, let's see, let's take people into the world of the penguin, see what happens. No, they're my favorite penguin and they're really curious if you set things down if you set remotes down they come they cannot leave them alone matter of fact they try <laughs> to bring them away and it's uh yeah it's priceless it's precious amazing uh, so what, we wanted to take you to another favorite place on the planet another place that's raw remote real the okavango delta no it's not the ocean but it is amazing and a lot of you have been to africa and and been on safari or dream about going to saf on safari Yes, try, save up your dimes and your nickels and go if you can. David and I had the extreme privilege of going underwater in the Okavango Delta and working with everything from mamirid fish to crocs to elephants. And I can't, there's not words to describe what it is like to swim or photograph an elephant underwater where it's weightless and it's in it just it rolls on the sand to itch its skin and it pushes its tusks into the sand to glean you know to, to actually like dental floss it's in it's just incredible and we want to take you behind the scenes a little bit what it's like working in um in Botswana so take us to the take us to the next frame Alex because we were working with Nile crocodiles, and, and this is actually, I got, a little, I got a little sad about this. They decided that we were working with Nile crocodiles, so we needed a witch doctor <laughs> to create and to, to basically put a spell on David so he would not be attacked by a crocodile. And I was like, well, well wait a minute. I'm, I'm, go I'm on <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing. They insisted on this ceremony where David was actually anointed in this gunk you can see sprayed on his shirt. And David looks to be sort of in a trance, which he was. I was, he, it he, was. He, he ate, drank something out of a cup that. Oh dear. Yeah. The, that, and yeah. then they had a big, big mm -hmm. can of the special anti crocodile potion. To, Saf, and, yeah. And, yeah and, and Jennifer trod in it. I stepped in it. Um, <laughs> I think it wasn't subtle or yeah. subliminal. <laughs> it doesn't work the same way if you step in it. Okay, it's not the same. But the bottom line is, <laughs> on a geographic assignment, behind the scenes, almost anything, almost anything can happen. And this was, <laughs> this was the required witch doctor ceremony that Brad and Andy best to link. We said, they were our guides, and we said, and those are, the, those are incredible filmmakers. And we said, do we really have to go through this? And he says, it can't hurt. We're working with <laughs> there you go. And we, 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 we survived. And we survived. Yeah, and, we're and, here. And, and the expense book I put down, medical. Yeah, medical. Well, there you go. It's perfect. So, all right. Um, 
to our next place, our, another fabulous and incredible place on the planet that right now we can't get to. We have big ear friends there, Cuba. This is Gardens of the Queen Cuba, and it means so much to David and I. We first went there in 2000 with Peter Benchley, the author of Jaws, and it was, it was a magical eye-opening experience. Again, a collaboration where we met Noel Lopez, who became our hero, our underwater hero in Cuba. And Cuba is like a time capsule. It is a place in the Caribbean unlike any other because it looks like it did when Columbus landed there. It is, it is humming along and it's in the ecosystem. All the, all the networks, all of the, uh, the food chains are in check and, um, intact from prey on up to predator, from reef fish. There's huge uh, gardens of elkhorn coral that exist there that don't exist elsewhere throughout the Caribbean. And it's a magical place and literally a museum. It's a museum of the Caribbean. It looks like a place that I saw almost 60 years ago, intact, everything existing. The elkhorn coral, the fish, the reefs. So it is a marvelous thing. And I think actually Peter said the same thing when he rolled off the boat. It was like rolling back into his youth. It's an incredible wow. place and it still exists. And Michael, you go there, you lead trips there, and we go back on assignment. We were there, this is in, uh, the first time we went was 2000, and this was 2015 with our dear colleague, Le Leandro Blanco. And again, another collaboration. The pictures are not just ours. They are the product of a collaboration. They are the boat driver, the guy that fills your tanks, your guide, your pitcher is only as good as the guide who gets you there. And in this case, it's Noel Lopez. Everybody, we really feel strongly that everything we do is a collaboration. It just doesn't happen all by itself. So it's a, uh... now moving on to the next picture, it really is ironic that David got the, um, the crocodile, <laughs> anti crocodile um, goo. goo for Botswana because we needed it in Cuba. <laughs> so I was photographing a jellyfish uh, an upside down jellyfish in a mangrove in Gardens of the Queen. And I heard this squeaking, popping, a lot of chatter by David and the strobes going off. And, and so we have a signal and that signal is a lot, just noise and then rapid flashes of the, of the strobes is a signal to one of us that, hey, hey, turn around something, you know, something great is here. So this was coming up behind me. I had no idea. David was letting me know, and I turned around and saw that. <laughs> Hello, handsome. How are you? What a moment. He was, um, we were working in his backyard, or her, and they are used to snorkelers and divers, so I really wasn't in danger uh, it was good of David to let me know that he was there. Uh, that was kind. Uh, nice yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Always looking thing, out for each other, you know? I know. That's just, <laughs> right before then, he took out an entirely enormous insurance policy. Oh, yes. But um, <laughs> a lot of husbands and lawyers have asked, will you take my wife diving after they saw this? So that uh, was, Right. Um, this is another one of those emotional sets of images, the before and after. And one thing in storytelling we want to talk quickly about to other storytellers out there is getting the story right. What's the story here? Does this belong in the National Enquirer? Husband almost kills wife or takes picture instead of saving wife? Or what, what's the story? The, the main character in this is the crocodile. He's a symbol. What's he a symbol of? He's a symbol of a healthy reef. He is the ultimate symbol that Cuba, Gardens of the Queens, is getting it right. He is the ultimate predator. Why does he exist and why do all of his cousins exist there? Because they have enough food in that food chain and why? Because they have, they have oversight and they have protection and they have an incredible marine protected area there. So when People have wanted to do stories around those two images. We say, you can. Please don't make it sensationalized. Please don't take it out of context. I was not in any danger simply because these, these guys know, these reptiles know divers and they know photographers and they know snorkelers. We're going by each other all the time in the channel and he was curious. 
So when we can use them as a symbol of successful com um, conservation, we're very happy, but you have to control the narrative if you can. And once it gets away from you, it's, it's doomed. And we've been, oh, so many requests, can, can we run the, just the one with the one behind my head? Can we run just that one and tell about the horror of the whole thing? And I said, no, but we can talk about the success of conservation. So it's all in the narrative and it's all in the storytelling. And uh, yeah, so if, whoever dies with David, just be ready for that. Whole thing. <laughs> anything could anything, happen. Anything can happen. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to take you to my next favorite place, uh, our favorite place, but very, very, very special to me. And I'm very attached to it. We started here in 2011. 11. 11. Yeah. 2011. And this is the Harp Seal Nursery in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And this guy, these guys are the females come up onto the ice in late February and they'll nurse their pups from 12 to 15 days in late February. They come down from the Arctic, both the males and the females. They look for ice in the Gulf to form. They come up on that sea ice platform and they birth their pups. And if you go to the next, it, the next video will show us an, a newborn pup. This is a day, it's, it's born. That day is not even an hour old, it's still wet. From birth, it hasn't nursed yet. Mom's in behind the pup. Uh, Again, I'm putting up a remote video, and what I have to do, storytellers out there. Okay, this is an a magic. This is an amazing magical moment. But guess what? That pup found my little remote camera. And it was quickly time to get that little remote camera out of there because he needed to nurse. I took approximately less than 15 to 20 seconds with the animal and realized I could be interfering on nature and get the heck out of the way. And the other thing about births, this, this pup is called a yellow coat because it, it still has the tinge of yellow from the amniotic fluid. The really cool thing and the holy grail up there is no one has actually filmed a birth. This one I saw from a distance, the female does a big old loop and she does it fast and she's dragging her belly and I looked across and I, I said, oh my gosh, what is that, what is that female doing? And she dropped the pup before I could even, I mean, the next thing I knew she had a pup behind her. It's incredible because the filming of the pup hasn't, I think it's been, it's happened once, decades ago, once, but not since. And we're all kind of waiting to see it. So I'm, let's see, let's keep going. What's the, uh. We have another, this is from 2020, this is this March. What I do is we get in the water, we go topside, I deploy video, I go in the water, and this is the mother. She's beneath the ice, but she goes up to check on her pup all the time. And the other thing we did this year is we deployed hydrophones so we were, could record their voices and the conversations beneath the ice. And it's an incredible, it sounds like a rainforest. It's just, it's magical. And there she is. So what happens after 12 to 15 days, the mother nurses the pup, the pup gains weight about six pounds a day, actually about five pounds a day. The mother loses about six pounds a day in the nursing process. After 15 or so days, she's gonna, she's gonna abandon the pup on the ice. Before that happens, she may teach the, the pup how to swim. She'll coax him into water. How does she identify her own pup? She identifies her pup with a nose to nose kiss of recognition with scent. It's like this. Are you my mom? Are you my pup? And it's this scenting. And when I was in the water with these guys, I realized, oh my gosh, they do it in the water as well. It's in, it, was a, it was a first time realization that these guys scent in the water and it's a common, you are my mom, you're my pup. And what this mother was doing was moving it off to another ice flow because she was a little conscious there were males in this area, male harp seals. And so I, I went along side by side with them for a while and made this uh, just an amazing, had these amazing moments in there where she actually intervened. I was mauled by a male and she intervened and she actually battled the male off and it's, it was a life-changing moment. But what I want to say to people about this place is that 
This is another place you can go. It's another place you can visit. This year, I had the extraordinary opportunity to take an educator with me up there. Uh, her name was Lynn Hyde Kellogg. And why did I take an educator to the ice? Because I want to be able to take this back into classrooms and talk about harp seals and their life on a vanishing nursery of ice as a face of climate change. These creatures are battling literally to survive long enough on a nursery of ice. And it is not just for National Geographic photographers no, and Discovery and BBC. You can go to the harp seals. You can go by boat. If you are a snorkeler or diver, Mario Sear runs these trips by boat. It's, there is a limited, there's limited access. It is a very unpredictable setup. Is the ice gonna form? Is it not gonna form? Is it gonna form? And, or you can go by hotel, fly into Magdalen, book into the Chateau Madeleineau, helicopters go out, you're out there on the ice for two to three hours and you can, you can go as many times as you want. But it's an extraordinary place to connect your family as an individual. I've, I've met, let's see, who have I met up there? I've met cancer, uh, cancer victims, divorcees, newlyweds. You gotta go. And I'm hoping, and, and if any of my family's watching this, hello, anyone, my family, I'm taking you. So you all better go buy your Arctic muck boots, okay? That's what I'm hoping. All right, so get ready. There are all kinds of sales at REI in Patagonia right now. Get your stuff while it's Michael, cheap. Michael <laughs> wanted to go this year, and it just was so unpredictable. It was on, yeah. off, off. And, okay, I just heard from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. I asked about how this year wrapped up 2020, somewhere between not normal and catastrophic. We lost anywhere from 30 to 50% of the pups this year due to poor ice. It was oh. not a good year. Yeah. And I am still deciphering the data. I still, because we, we stay with this and we go up every year that we can. And again, it's all about collaboration. I work with Mario Sear, David and I have worked with Mario since 2011. Brian Scary had been up there before <laughs> us. And we work with Chateau Madeleineau and a great team there. And I'm just telling you, go. Go see the face of climate change through the harp seals. It's incredible. And great, great chowder. Great seafood chowder. Very good. <laughs> okay. Important right. stuff. It is. Now on to warmer climbs. This is the most important ever. <laughs> These, this collaboration, we are right in the middle. Let me back up. We are in the middle of a National Geographic grant on coral status science and solutions. And part of that, what we decided to document was next generation. These are next generation, pick one, choose one, marine biologists, scientists, writers. Uh, writers photographers. These are the scuba knots, the international scuba knots, and this is the Florida chapter. Um, it could be the Sarasota chapter, actually, that we teamed with, with Moat Marine Lab in the Florida Keys. We'd been working with Moat, another amazing collaboration, helping us tell the story of coral in the Florida Reef Tract and the restoration of coral there, their entire team, and it's a, a project we look forward to going forward, and you want to talk about Full Circle? Who Jeannie, was in Moat? Jeannie Clark was the founder of Moat Marine Lab. Does it uh -huh, get- there we go. <laughs> does it get any better than that? These kids, this next generation set of kids learning coral restoration at Moat are descendants of Jeannie's dream. It's about right. Can you yep. believe yep. that? It's incredible. It's a pretty so happy are, connection. No, it's incredible. So these pictures, hashtag next generation, to us are priceless. Those kids are priceless. Meeting the scuba nods, and we hope to dive with them again and again and again and again to tell their story and to get out with other next generationals and tell their story because we are eager to see these kids are age ranges are 14 to 19 and to dive into the water 
with them and watch them. They're there for a week on site at Moat. And by the time they leave, they're more qualified underwater than we are. They did a, they did a course with the uh, Special Forces Underwater Ops people on navigation that David and I would have failed. And I'm not mm -hmm. <laughs> They also host the Wounded Warriors. And they work with the combat Wounded Warriors, yes, underwater, and this coral reef restoration project that they do. So we wanted to take you right into the middle of it all. And a picture that just about says it all for me. David, you said, what, what is the most valuable pictures on the planet? Most valuable picture on the planet is not the picture of Earth from space. It's the picture of your family. It mm. is beyond value. It is so valuable that when a tornado wrecks your house or a typhoon destroys the place, you go back and you find these pictures <coughs> of your family. Like, like Michael's mother. Yeah. Like when I saw Michael's tribute to his mother, I, I think I wept. Those Bert. are the most important pictures. Even though we are storytellers, we go out across the world and we come back with a set of storytelling images. But what's most important? They might be the ones you keep in your wallet. They might be the ones that's over here behind me. They might be the picture that's never made yet. This picture on assignment, this is the best of both worlds for me, on assignment with the scuba knots, with Moat Marine Lab, this is my nephew, <laughs> Logan Mackenheimer. And you That's know great. what it's like to go on National Geographic assignment and photograph your nephew who's 14 years old on a coral reef restoration project when you didn't know it was gonna happen. Hmm. Uh, it's priceless and it's, uh, I, it gives us hope that these, that these teenagers, if this is hard business, this is not easy stuff that they're doing. They have classroom, they have in water, they have, it's technical, it's, it's, it's a lot. David, they have a 14 hour nonstop day. David ran away. He's I, like, I'm going to get a hot dog. I fell um, asleep in class. He did. <laughs> it's uh, it's brutal. What hey, you're like? not allowed to say that out loud. Shh, quiet. <laughs> the racer at me. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing because the commitment to host them is since it mo there's nothing like it in the commitment these kids give back. There's nothing like it. And it's, uh, it's something. So we're gonna leave it with a family picture underwater on assignment. So yeah. I'm, I feel yeah. pretty darn fortunate to be, able to, to be able to see that and share that. So, hey, Michael. Okay, um, Alex, let me just check for questions, please. But I, I am checking. I, I got a question for both of you. With all the amazing places you've been to, and what do you think in, 30 years from now, in 2050, what will we come up of the places you've been to in 30 years' time, which is more urgent that we should uh, pay, pay more attention to? Oh, Michael. That's a tough one, you know? Michael, the Arctic, you, we all, those of us who have been there know that it is vanishing now. Very I don't quickly. Even, very quickly. I don't even have to go to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. I can go to the Harp Seals in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Right outside this window, I'm on, we're on the St. Lawrence, a thousand miles away are the heart skills. Every year, is the ice gonna form? Is it not? Will it be weak ice? Will it be great ice? Will the, will the harp seals survive? So go even further north. And we all know that we can now take the ships even further and further. We're seeing polar bears far, far, far from the ice, sometimes swimming with their cubs and knowing darn well more than likely they're not in some cases going to get back or discover ice heart breaks in a lot of those situations what but, will what will a reef look like in 50 years well the great barrier reef and yeah, all this yeah, isolation yeah. that we've had and you're in australia the great barrier reef this year has has bleached and we're waiting to hear how much to what extent but along with what's happening there's also science. And you had to, in talking about and presenting this and what we're doing in powerful yeah. images, one of the things with the Coral Status Science and Solutions Project we're covering 
if it's amazing, is coral restoration and all the technology that goes into it. We're working with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Peter Harrison, who you know, the coral spawning guru. It's, his work is astounding, along with many other scientists. So are we keeping pace with the change? We're trying, and our, well, we're trying to document yeah. they're keeping pace with it. So it's, there's hope. And look at Cuba, look at Tubataha, look at parts of the Philippines, look at Raja Ampat, look at these places that are still vaults of success. Yeah. And look at the populations we are saving. And look at what's happened over the last month and a half of, social is of our isolation, where animals have come back to certain areas where we can now see because there's less air pollution. In India, you can see the Himalayas. From a lot. So 2050, yeah. it's going to be different. Those reefs, I, I, I think they're going to be, in some cases, a lot less diverse. Those species that can stand those temperature changes, we're going to see more of them. Um, I think the, climate, the and the Antarctic and the reef we know now will not be the same in 2050. No. Um, that Even is now, when we go now, the last trip to Antarctica, it was raining. Penguins can't, penguins weren't built for rain. We know this. They can't, they're just, they're just not designed for that. Or and mud. To, or mud. And to watch them maneuver through the, this new world of rain and mud, and it's just, it's not good. And this year, carcasses of harp seals washing up with heads crushed <laughs> because of bad ice. It's changing Ooh. and it's yeah. no, it's, it's changing. It's, it's all changing. Um, yeah. And at what pace and can we, can we slow it down? Vote. Yeah. Vote. Vote. I don't, yep. I don't know. Yeah. Everybody makes a difference. I make a difference. You make a we difference. Are. Our choices yeah. make a difference. We are collectively to yeah. make a big difference. We are in essence uh, in a war with wartime footing to try and save the planet. And one of the things you win a war with is you, win a war with the idea that second best today is what works. And we will compromise and make choices that are compromising and they will work. And then we'll move on from there. But all of us, all of us have some forward movement and how we deal with our lives and our planet. This has been a real wake up call, COVID-19. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, we're in it together. Yeah. One of us what one of us does impacts the other. And it's the same way in the environment. We can't, we, we don't, we aren't living in a vacuum. What we do in our choices make a difference. I don't care of your political stance. I really don't, but we are in this together and everything we do makes a difference. And it's, uh, it's gonna be a journey. And I'm hoping, I, I just hope that we don't lose too many species through the journey. And I'm, I'm very wary of that very sad about that but that's why we're spending all that time with next generation though and that's why i sit down and i video them and i listen to them because we're in meetings all the time right you're in meetings i bet and you're in meetings i bet and you're talking about kids it's all about kids the next generation what we need to do is we need to put them in these presentations michael where's your kids get your kids in these things let them <laughs> We let we need to let them do the talking. That's what we're trying to do with our next generation coverage is why are you here? What do you hope for? What are your dreams? Yeah, let's listen to some kids. I want to hear kids. <laughs> Alex? Would be good. Yeah, so we, we do have a few questions. Um, one of them comes from our friend Claudio um, over here in Zoom and kind of relates to what you were just saying about um, these sort of changes in the way we look at things. Um, he wants to know, what do you think humans, uh, with our current COVID situation, do you think we'll pause and take the opportunity to change what we're doing wrong with climate change? Um, what can we do to further that? Do I think we'll be able to, I think we're seeing, we're seeing some results of a pause. Um, we're seeing animals actually appearing in animals where, or in places where humans aren't anymore. And we're yeah. seeing some, in, you know, some improvement in uh, air quality. And at the same time, I think sadly, humans are gonna have a short memory and go back to whatever it was they were doing before. 
frankly, that's my opinion that, yeah, I want it to be truthful. I don't want to tell you the truth. I don't because I, I watch, I watch us as a species yeah. and we just kind of have a tendency to think not what, you know, what can you do for me? Not what can I do for you? Yeah. And I'm a little tired with what can you do for me? I want, I kind of want to, I want to be a part of the solution. I do. And I want, I'm willing to make changes and some sacrifices to be part of the solution. I'm happy to. So I, I'm hoping that maybe, maybe my glass will be half yeah. full and other people will decide that too. So. And one of the things we can do on a very personal thing in our little business of underwater photography is to look back and what we've shot to edit and also to make sure that we can preserve this stuff because right now we're documenting a time and a place that may not exist. This is the first part of the discussion. So this is a time to really do a little bit of introspection on yourself and do a little bit of physical introspection called editing on your work. Which David's been doing, by the way, in lockdown. So all of us as shooters yep. have all this, depending on how long you've been shooting, you have this archive, you have this baseline. Yep. And then you get to go back to other places that you've been. Go back with your baseline and do, it's what we're doing. It's called Coral Through the Lens of Time. And basically, I don't know if you can see me, but this all entire that. cabinet, look at that. Would oh, be decades, slides. And decades and decades of a history of the Red Sea. Almost, the 40, almost 42 assignments. Not to oh mention. My little, gosh. Cardboard, little cardboard things. Remember yes. Little cardboard things. Yes, slides. I remember those. <laughs> today, today I, edited, uh, I edited crocodiles and manta rays and uh, Loch Ness. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Three different we stories. Missed, I didn't see him all day. I heard, I heard Nessie's back now that there are no people outside. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, she's back and she's worse. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that was one of your first assignments yeah. with Emery. That yeah. was That's true. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. We have Emery's to... coming on. Emery Christoph is coming on uh, OG Live in the next next week or so. We can't wait to see him again. It's been way too long. Oh, my yeah. God. It's going to be great. Wait. Yeah. Oh, I, can I send you a secret picture for that? Are you sure? Yes. Please. Yes. <laughs> we I would never it. say no to such an offer. <laughs> hey, folder right here of him. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. I like this. <laughs> um, yes. So we, we have another uh, question floating around on Ocean Geographic Live Facebook. Um, Jennifer is wondering, how worried should we be about an increase of illegal fishing due to the lack of divers and tourists? right now I, yeah right I, now is in like because there are people I, patrolling out first, and things like that uh, as, because i just had a meeting that this morning with uh, a few stakeholders and mark ehrman uh yep. fortunately down me so in rajam part the the there some pet yeah, some petrol going out and they caught fishermen fishing and with tons of fish got, got them arrested uh they're out there they're exploiting a situation because they know they can they know they can get away with it Yep. Especially in North Rajan part and all these signature sites, they're out there. Uh, so we are worried and we're trying to find solutions. And even places like Komodo, no one knows mm. what's happening. But we like to think that, you know, we go back to a better reef because we, we are not there. But fortunately, especially in remote places, yeah. the fisherman is, is up there. That's well, in a vacuum, we know what happens. You're... You're relying on an honor system, and we also know what happens. The question is, can the fishermen find a market for their fish now? Yeah, yeah. True. They yeah. Will. They will. But there are some places that will, that I would hazard a guess, will be humming along with protection, and that's probably Tubataha under yeah. Angelique Bronco, I'm betting. Um, for sure. There are probably, I'm wondering about Gardens of the Queens. That makes yep. me nervous because she's 50 miles offshore. Yep. And these other places that don't have oversight, what's going on in the Galapagos right now? Yeah. Uh, we don't know. But yes, Michael. And that would explain why I couldn't get a hold of Mark Erdman yeah. today. Okay, and that explains that. Um, but yes, I, it occurred to me last night, I was, we were writing, writing a bit for an article, and I, I fear, I fear your everyone's concern is not wrong about that that while yeah. we while the eyes are away what happens so exactly 
-hmm. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up Cuba before, especially Noel, because Michael and I were talking the last couple of days. Um, and uh, obviously, all of our dive guides uh, in Cuba have no work, essentially, at the moment, because there's no tourism at the moment. So um, we're trying to put something together, possibly for the weekend, to kind of get together all of our friends and colleagues who have been to Cuba, been to Gardens of the Queen, been diving with Noel, to kind of do a mini fundraiser, share yeah, our always, photos, talk about yeah, how much we love Cuba stuff. and help them out. So we're working yeah, on we'll it. Fundraiser on, on Facebook Live. Cuba yeah. We will we'll come to that and announce that uh, before the weekend. Yeah, we're, we're we working on it right Because now. they're not getting any money. There's no, not enough food on a the table. There's yep. no tourists, there's no tips, and they're left on their own by the company. So we need to do something yeah. for them. We're in. We're in. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been uh, I know, uh, over an hour. We, we, it's a lot of time from you guys. And uh, <laughs> thank you so, so much. Well, you know what? Thank Ocean Geographic for um, hosting these because we've been catching them and uh, enjoying them. And it's a great way. It's a great way to share the oceans while we're all in lockdown. And uh, it's a great way. I haven't seen David all day, so I get to see him tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Glad we can facilitate a nice evening. Editing slides. And something to look forward to everybody out there. We hopefully we get Jennifer and David with us again in 2022 on our next Elysium expedition to Antarctica. We're going to a place called Danger Island. I've been to this place uh, in 2008. It's out of the beaten track. Nobody really goes there, but the scientists documented uh, 1.5 million mating pairs of Adelaide penguins. <laughs> we do not know what's happening to them now, but we want to go back. And then there also be a lot of, lots of signs uh, on, on this expedition with, with plastic, with whales. And so that is 2022 February, but we'll announce that uh, in the next few months when, when this, this storm is over. Something to look forward to uh, two years from now. So once again, thank you everyone. And OG Live is on um, Ocean Geographic channel on YouTube. With the past 16 uh, sessions, you can find it there. And uh, thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow. We have Stay Amos, well. right? Stay healthy. Thank you guys. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much. Yeah, tomorrow we'll be back, same time with uh, Amos. Not cool. Anybody so. who uses this now or next time, see you with the harp seals. See you, Michael, with the harp seals. You got it. See you. Thank you. Right, all of this, if anybody's watching, cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, <laughs> nephews, we're harp sailing. Get those mud boots. All right. I'll be there next March. Bye bye. Ciao. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, guys. Thanks so much for joining us.